Hi, everybody. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Mark Raven, and our guest today is Joy Mason. She describes herself as a strategist, an author, a speaker, and an entrepreneur. So she is the president of her company, Optimus Business Solutions, and she started that company after retiring from Eli Lilly. Um, Joy is the author of two books. The first one is titled The Optimist, Five Steps to Sustainable Solutions for Women in Business. And the other is called Purpose, a shift from driving it to embracing it. So Joy, thank you for being here. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Mark, and thank you for having me. This is long overdue. No. <laughs> yes, I'm glad we could yeah. do this. And um, we're not gonna do root cause analysis on, on overdue <laughs> or what, I'm, just, I'm happy you're here. I am too, thank you. <laughs> Um, so we're going to talk about all sorts of things, you know, considering the word optimist is in the name of your company and the title of your book. You know, we'll, we'll come back to that later on. I guess that's called a tease to help people um, keep listening. But, you know, as, as often do, you know, if there's one question that I, I tend to ask every guest here, I'll, I'll ask you, Joy, you know, how did you get introduced to continuous improvement and, you know, what style or flavor or, you know, the terminology varies, but what was your first introduction to any of this? My first introduction, Mark, to the word lean and what it meant was actually when I was going through my uh, Six Sigma certification through Purdue University. And so while I didn't get the lean Six Sigma certification, uh, lean is one of the modules that we get through that certification. And I don't know about you, but uh, when I was introduced to Lean and Six Sigma, I found a sector, I found words, I found a terminology, a philosophy that aligned with how I was already thinking. So it's kind mm -hmm. of um, the question I think is, when did you get introduced to this approach and the terms and the principles called lean, but I was already thinking that way uh, for quite mm -hmm. some time. I think that just evolved over a period of time in my work, my overall approach to how I look at um, issues and how work gets done. And when I found that, oh my gosh, this is something where I can uh, grow in my expertise and there's a discipline, I just thought, well, well, this is it, and loved it when I was introduced to it. Yeah. And that's, uh, you know, that's something I hear from people, um, that, that oh, wow moment. Like um, Dr. Greg Jacobson, who I've known and worked with at Kinexus, <laughs> he's the CEO there. He had that similar oh, wow moments when he first got introduced to the Kaizen style of continuous <laughs> improvement. He was a resident. He was like, this puts words to what I've been doing and trying to do. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, it's helpful to find a framework. Mm -hmm. um, so in your case, Joy, what, what, what were something in particular, what were some of the things that like most connected with you or resonated with you when you were introduced to this? Um, now I'll, I'll have to tell you, here's what's funny. Uh, because of how mm -hmm. I think, and I love frameworks and tools I got attached to the tools pretty pretty quickly. I, I just love tools because mm -hmm. to me they are um, robust, they're repeatable. Um, so again, I, I found a lot of enjoyment from taking these tools and applying them. But I had a coach during the time that I was introduced to Lean and he was a master uh, black belt. So a Six Sigma Master Black Belt. And I'll never forget the coaching that he gave me where he said, Joy, be careful, because he could tell I was so excited <laughs> about the tools and applying the tools. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. he just really uh, cautioned me that, yeah, the tools is part of it, but it's not all of what this work is about. And again, I... I when I talk about lean, I'm also talking about the continuous improvement field. So um, the tools was the initial attraction, but then when you also look at the principles of lean, respect for people mm -hmm. is part of lean as well. And that can easily get lost when you're the kind of person that gets just excited 
about some of the strategies and in, in tools. It's a mindset, but it's also about the people. So if you find anyone, and I'm sure you know this, Mark, who is not incorporating the respect for people, meaning mm -hmm. internal employees and clients, into how they mm -hmm. apply lean, then they're not doing lean. They're not doing it. I don't know what they're doing. <laughs> I guess maybe they're just applying tools, uh, but they're not showing fidelity to what lean is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And so as I have evolved um, as a continuous improvement professional, I have come to appreciate that part of it even more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's... Um an evolution that um, a lot of us, myself included, went through. You know, um, tools are easier to teach than mindsets and philosophies. Um, you know, people who are, let's say, you know, I was, uh, you know, working as an engineer, or if you're being asked to lead improvement projects, individuals who are not senior leaders can help drive tools more so than they can drive culture. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I appreciate the point you bring up that, you know, there are a lot of instances where you could be driving tools without the mindset and it could be damaging to the organization. It could um, be dysfunctional in different ways. It can push people away from improvement instead of drawing them Absolutely. In. Absolutely. And that kind of feeds into what I know we'll talk about. Uh, some employees, some people react to lean thinking this is just an avenue to lay people off. You know, it's just an avenue to get rid of people. And so there can be a guttural negative reaction to lean. And, you know, I, I want to be very transparent. In some of the continuous improvement efforts, it may be revealed that in order to maximize and optimize value, that maybe there are some activities and roles that are no longer needed, but that is not the goal or focus of lean, right? It's to make sure that we are optimizing value. It's always about the value. It's not about, uh, it's not about fewer employees and, and cutting. That people piece is really critical. And we'll, we'll, we'll come back and, and, and talk more about that later, because that was one of the things I saw you write about last year that kind of sparked like, oh, let's do a podcast on this topic of uh, lean versus layoffs. Um, so you talk about you know the mindset. And it's good that you got that coaching, right? Because some people don't have the benefit of that coaching. They keep just rolling along with you know pushing tools um, at, at people. So it's good that you got that coaching and, you know, you have this, these mindsets and approaches. And one thing I wanted to ask you about, you know, I've already mentioned, you know, I'm an engineer. I know your background is as a scientist, a microbiologist. What are your thoughts around, you know, when we talk about this culture that, they, that gets framed sometimes as scientific problem solving? Mm -hmm. what, what are some of your thoughts coming from your background as a, a scientist and, um, embracing whether it's lean or six sigma and um, this approach to problem solving and improvement well i do view uh, lean and six sigma as a scientific approach to problem solving in fact there was someone that i was speaking to a, a couple of weeks ago and sometimes mark i do not use the words lean or Six Sigma when I'm talking to mm -hmm. individuals. I'm very thoughtful about whether or mm -hmm. not that would be helpful. So I didn't use those words. And uh, when I was describing to her a way to go about maximizing value and, and problem solving, she said, that's a scientific method. <laughs> so she picked up on <laughs> a very methodical and intentional way of addressing issues, um, effectiveness and efficiency and problem solving. She picked that up without me saying those words. So mm -hmm. that, I mean, that is what it is. It's a scientific approach. However, again, I try to be very mindful because I have worked with um, individuals. Uh, well, a lot of my clients have 
are in the nonprofit sector. And I found uh, since I came out of Lilly and what I have found, there is not always a positive reaction to say, well, this is a scientific type approach to, uh, you know, optimizing value and problem solving and continuous improvement. Sometimes that resonates and sometimes that doesn't. So, yes, I do think it's a scientific method towards, um, you know, achieving maximum effectiveness and efficiency and value. But I'm just mindful, mindful when I when I um, draw yeah. on that analogy. Yeah, I, I, I wonder, um, have, I've done a little bit of work with um, a couple of nonprofits and I wonder if part of that reaction is the that the idea of scientific sounds very uncaring mm -hmm. or unfeeling, mm -hmm. and you know it, it, it might be too broad of a generalization. But if you think of like you know the Myers Briggs scale, I think engineering and scientists are going to be uh, you know in the T range, the, the the thinking versus feeling range, and people working in nonprofits may tend toward the F and the feeling mm -hmm. side. So how do we how do we navigate that and work together? People might have different personality types or, you know, different feelings about their role and what their organization is and does. And Mark, to that point, here's what I have found is to find a uh, common values and goals. And it always works when we have a conversation. So between me and the nonprofit client, and it's usually the leader and then with the leaders um, leadership team, and then we go down with the rest of the staff. When we talk about maximizing the impact for those that they're serving, uh, trying to be more efficient and thoughtful, being more effective, no one disagrees with that, right? I mean, we're all on mm -hmm. the same page with that impact that we're trying to have. In fact, um, yeah, that's one of the the books here, right? I don't know if you've... <laughs> Oh, I've, I've heard of that book. Lean yeah. yeah, so for the uh, social, um, yeah, it says how to innovate for radically greater social good. So this is Lean Impact by Anne May Chang. Uh, so we all want to maximize that impact. And as long as that's kind of the, the common destination that we all have. And again, with those clients, I don't use lingo. I don't talk about how we're gonna, you know, do the gimba. I, I don't, I just don't. Mm -hmm. um, that's a turn off for them. So stay aligned with the common goal. Yeah, and you know, it's there are times when Toyota, when they talk about some of their purpose and values, and they talk a lot about you know providing benefit to society. Which is really high, you know. It's it. I I appreciate that and I admire that. That's that's kind of high-minded for being a for-profit manufacturing mm -hmm. company. And Toyota people will say, like at, at the core, they are a manufacturing mm -hmm. company. You know, they like the culture of the company is built off of manufacturing culture. That's not always true in every manufacturing company, but you know, it could be engineering driven or whatever. But yeah, I think it's it's interesting, or maybe that that that's a point where Toyota very effectively partners with nonprofits. I don't know if you've seen the videos of like Toyota working with a food bank, mm -hmm. for example, and coming in and looking at the operations of a food bank. There is strong mm -hmm. social mission and good feelings generated, mm -hmm. but then, you know, Toyota approaches for improvement can, can apply in that setting as I'm, I'm sure you're seeing mm -hmm. in your work. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so we'll, we'll come back and, and talk more about um, the work that you're doing now. But, Joy, I would like to you know, explore a little bit more about your experiences at Lilly because I've never worked in uh, you know, a pharmaceutical setting. Um, I'm wondering, I'm guessing, or I guess I'll ask as a question, you have a lot of scientists mm -hmm. at Lilly, so there might be people that resonate with this idea of scientific thinking. But at the same time, I wonder, is there was there hesitancy where people would say, wait a minute, what you, why are we trying to learn from Toyota? We don't build cars <laughs> here at Lilly. We're, we're, we're improving lives and saving lives and on the cutting edge of science in different ways. What, what was it like within the Lilly environment? Were there adaptations or was it a matter of finding, as you were saying, common 
interests, common ground together? Well, Mark, that's a good question, but I want to take you back to what I mentioned earlier regarding the coaching that I got. And when um, my coach said, Joy, be, be careful from overemphasizing the tools and getting really excited about the lingo, that was coaching for internal, <laughs> for the work that I was doing yeah. with uh, project team members inside the organization, not outside. You know, it's interesting, but the pharmaceutical company, probably the first perception is that it's, uh, and I believe we had about 40,000 employees globally. And I would imagine that the common perception is that the majority of those 40,000 people, employees are scientists. And that's not the case. Yeah. <laughs> so we have a whole okay. range of uh, areas and every area has their own culture. You have marketing, you have uh, marketing and sales, legal, IT, uh, HR, you have regulatory. So oftentimes mm -hmm. we are engaged in projects that go across uh, different departments and sectors because across all of us, we deliver what we deliver, not within one department and a silo. No department can do it alone. So what I found is that across departments and within departments, you have a range of individuals who either resonate with lean or do not. So when I was talking about my work with nonprofits, and being very mindful of, he's saying this is the scientific approach and, and all that. It's not only for nonprofits that I was very mindful. It was also within um, the organization, within Pharma and within Lilly. Now we had a centralized group and I know there are other large companies where it's structured the same, where you have a centralized group that is focused on Lean Six Sigma. And those individuals are typically master black belts because they are also trying to influence the culture. That's their role as a master black belt. With my role as a black belt, I was actually in my division. So that's where my reporting was, actually in the quality division. In the quality division, I'd say, again, because you do have chemists, pharmacists, uh, me, a microbiologist, that wasn't as common, but a lot of scientists. So there was a reception to it. But again, even within the quality division being too lingo heavy what and, and um, giving it a name, people have change fatigue and if you, it, when you call it, when you call an initiative something, folks tend to think flavor of the month. You know, they just, they just hear this phrase and it's something else that's coming through. So I'll just take it back to what I mentioned before. And that is being very mindful to how new initiatives and strategies land on people, their change fatigue. Uh, how, uh, what helps them be most receptive to new approaches and strategies. And a lot of times that means you may be bringing in the lean mindset and using different tools, but you're not always identifying it as such. So that's the same in and out. I know that's a long answer to your question, but. No, it's okay. It was a fairly broad question, so it kind of <laughs> lends to a good long answer. Um, so what I hear you saying is, is, you know, Lean and Six Sigma at Lilly was not just about production, that there were applications in, in many different business functions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, and, and I did not encounter anybody saying, well, you know, we're not making cars and, you know, this is not Toyota and you can't just apply it because a lot of people don't even know the history <laughs> of where of where lean comes from. So when we're bringing sure. those types of strategies into an organization, I did not find where employees were automatically making a connection to Toyota and cars and saying, hey, that's not us. It was more of a, 
okay, you know, what initiative is this and where does this fit in with everything else we're trying to do? That was more the mindset. Yeah. 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 It, it, you bring up that flavor of the month issue. You know, sometimes people ask me like, you know, well, how do we make sure lean isn't flavor of the month? And, and, and that tends to come from organizations that have a history of flavor of the month. Mm -hmm. So you can't just tell people, well, this is not just another flavor of the month because they might not believe you. <laughs> so, okay, prove it. And, you know, how many organizations out there would say, well, we tried total quality management and that didn't really last. We tried theory of constraints and nobody really took to that. So then we did Six Sigma. Now we're doing Lean Six Sigma. And at like, well, at what point do people step back and wonder why are initiatives or flavors fading away instead of grabbing a new flavor? That's a different level of problem solving. And Mark, unfortunately, I have done the what you just mentioned, where I where I say it's it's not. Uh, it looks like an initiative, but it's a mindset and way of thinking. And I, I guess everybody comes in and says that for every initiative and strategy that they're trying to bring in, but. I, I honestly believe that. And what I have noticed is that, um, again, that respect for people and building relationships, it really matters. And so when I say that, you know, this is a robust way of going about doing business that will last and stick with you and you will not look at operations or problem solving the same afterwards, it will stick with you. I can only right. hope that because I emphasize the relationship part of uh, what I do, that they believe me because of the relationship, not necessarily just believe it because they are words and they've, because they are words they believe mm -hmm. joy is sincere in saying that you will not look at things the same once you start to understand the approach and philosophy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm sure you had built up trust with those people. That's a part of that yes. relationship. You didn't come in. That, that's a challenge sometimes coming in as an outside consultant. You don't have that history with people and you can't say, no, uh, trust me, because people might say, no, thanks. I mean, don't know. You, know, you can't make anybody. Right. Yeah. But you were able to build on that. So mm -hmm. that's probably that's probably at least one of the adjustments now of uh, being um, outside working with other organizations. Right. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, when you talk about principles and, and, and mindsets, you, know, you brought up the idea of breaking down silos. That is, uh, yeah, I think, you know, universally powerful and I'm curious what your experiences are, but I think of, you know, hospital health systems being very siloed, deeply siloed organizations where when you start looking at things as a value stream, like for me, the one example that comes to mind is the value stream uh, with a patient who's in the emergency room, a nurse there draws a tube of blood and sends it to the lab and the lab turns that into information that goes back to the clinicians. And the lab might be literally 150 feet down the hall from the emergency department. And I can't tell you how many times the ED people, they've never been to the lab. The lab people have never been to the ED. And so what, what I've found is when it, it goes beyond the process knowledge that's lacking. It's a lack, a lacking in relationships where I've found, you know, it's easier to blame, say the tongue in cheek, those nameless, faceless jerks in that other department when you don't know their names and their mm -hmm. faces. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, what were, what were some of your experiences um, of, of trying to help break down silos and build relationships and trust and communication across these different functions? Well, it, it's a constant process to... Uh, I don't want to say break down those um, barriers because I don't know if you break them down. I don't know if that's the right phrase, mm. but it's working across the departmental structures because there are some structural things that are in place that contribute to silo building. 
right? And, it, and it's hard to, especially when you're in a large organization, to overcome the structures. And so that's why it's very um, dependent on having leaders and or champions who are constantly working across the silos to bring people together. It's a constant, right? But someone's got to champion that, lead it, and understand the importance of constantly doing that. So with the role that I had, and I'll focus on the last decade when I was at Lilly, it was project management for um, global projects. So I worked across our international affiliates and it was a challenge. So not only do you have technical services, quality control, the laboratories, and I worked with individuals in um, procurement. Those are different departments, but I also had to coordinate across different sites. So there's Puerto Rico, uh, there was France, there was Italy, Spain, Mexico. I can't think of all of our sites. I think there were about 10 different sites. So just mm -hmm. imagine with all those uh, uh, silos that are geographical, they're departmental, there are many types of silos. And so what I've found is by default, I guess being human, we end up um, separating ourselves and saying, okay, I did my part. And also when things go wrong, pointing the finger, I think maybe just from being human, right. that is the default. Mm -hmm. But in order for all of us to have the common goal of what needs to get done, uh, there has to be a regular, frequent intentionality for bringing all of us together. So I had regular, frequent meetings where we all are reminded of what is the goal, where are we headed, and so everybody can nod their head to that and realize that they're all mm -hmm. contributing. They all have roles and responsibilities towards contributing towards the goal. And we're talking every week to all march towards the goal. Now with that um, project management role, what was interesting was, and this has been transferable as I've worked with other large projects, is to be the negotiator to have a good understanding of what is the core that we all need to march to the same beat versus what are some other um, other things outside of the core where we can negotiate and be flexible. So what you need for your department or your site in France, you can do it differently and that's okay. And that is a negotiation and a balance that is mm -hmm. ongoing um, and constant negotiation. So I, I just think that was an invaluable role that I had the last 10 years to work across many different um, silos. But what I have found, the minute that the person who is either leading or championing, working across, as soon as they pull back, you see it just must be some built-in default with being human. That <laughs> folks will go right back to their silos. So that has to be a way of doing business to keep that communication and coordination, um, negotiation and understanding the big picture to keep all that together. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I agree with you. I think the tendency to want to wall ourselves off and think about our, let's say in, in this instance, professional group our organization, our team. I, that does, it does seem like there's some human nature there. The tendency to blame others when we can deflect it from ourselves, I think is absolutely a matter of human nature as you know, an evolutionary trait <laughs> that turned out to be helpful. It, we must have found it helpful for it, that trait still to be there and be there pretty strongly. Yeah. But you would just hope yeah. over time that, um, especially when you're working on co a common initiative where it takes everyone working together in order to accomplish the goal, you would just hope that over time people w w would see that there's greater benefit 
right? By working across the silos and working together. But again, I think there's something in the, the neuron structure <laughs> mm-hmm. where we're yeah. working a kind of up upstream here to um, get everyone to see the long-term benefit. Yeah. And I mean, for me, you probably don't literally see a light bulb above my head, but you've really given me pause to think about the, I like the language you're using, Joy, around working across silos. Because mm-hmm. I don't know if this was your, I mean, the, the reflection for me um, is that breaking down focuses on the silo and breaking down might seem a little violent as if we're tearing a structure down as opposed to focusing on the people and people can work yes. across. Absolutely. Department. Yeah, and yeah. and you know, I, I think maybe we're having the same insight here around the same time, just from the discussion when you said the word, uh, or I think you said the break down the silos. I, I, yeah, I did say just, breaking down. I, yeah, for some reason in this conversation, I reflected on that, um, and it just felt like a strong word. Uh, I, you know, I just don't know if we break them down. Because the silos actually serve a purpose. Um, mm-hmm. They serve a purpose, but we have to be mindful that there are um, there are benefits of the silo, but then there are some drawbacks of the silo. So we have to have strategies yeah. to deal with the drawbacks. And that can be just like I was talking about working with the social sector where we focus on the common goal and how we all work together to achieve that. But I can't say the word often enough. That has to be a constant and very deliberate effort. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so thank you, because I thank you for questioning or challenging that phrase breaking down, because I guess, you know, I've never really thought about it beneath the surface of the words. And I think words do matter. Yeah. So Mm -hmm. thank you for raising that. But what you're describing, you know, I'm thinking back to, um, you know, I was describing departments that are 150 feet down the hall. You were working in situations where it might have been 150 degrees around the world. <laughs> yeah. That's a different challenge. Yeah. It was, and it was tough. But Mark, I just learned, usually when you come through it and you reflect back, you see how much you learned from it that's transferable to um, other projects. And it took me some time being away from the global project management that I could see there was so much to be gained and therefore applied to local projects. Like you said, where folks are just a hallway away or a floor away, those same types of principles regarding how you pull individuals together there's still a core there um, of, of a skill set that applies. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So thank you for sharing some of that background and, and, and experience. And you know, I'd like to come back and, and talk more about a phrase you brought up, respect for people, and maybe connect it back to what you had shared and what your thoughts are on lean versus layoffs, as I remember you framing it. Um, can I share some of your thoughts on that? Oh, well, I have a lot of thoughts. <laughs> well, good. We have the time. Lean versus uh, layoffs. <laughs> I started talking about lean versus layoffs maybe the middle of last year. Because, again, it it seems like it is counterintuitive to our human nature to think about how we can utilize this rare oppor- this rare moment that we're in here with the pandemic to optimize and maximize value first before we talk about cutting staff. It just seems like a knee-jerk reaction when we're in tough times because I know that businesses, or- organizations, and agencies were hit hard um, in some industries more than most with this lockdown that occurred last year and there's so much uncertainty now and and variability in work. And so it makes sense that it's very tempting to think I've got to cut my staff first. But my challenge when I started talking about lean before layoffs is let's see if we can 
challenge ourselves, press the pause button and consider some of the principles that I put out there are uh, actions are lean and then some aren't. It just is about, um, again, how do we think just a little differently? Because when you cut employees, organizations may not consider that there is a negative effect. Yes, you're, you're cutting some of the, um, you know, a big line item is comp and bin, that's true, but you're subjected to higher unemployment taxes and what is not readily, well, I don't hear people talking about, and that is survivor syndrome. You have employees that are left behind and they're mourning the loss of their employees. Uh, that's really tough. These are folks that they've been maybe spending more time with, uh, even compared to their family. So there's mm -hmm. survivor syndrome and that can impact morale as well as productivity. Right. Um, so there's that. And then there's the cost of what it takes to even train employees. There's a lot of direct and indirect costs that go into bringing new people on board because this won't last forever. So that means you're going to let people go and then you'll have to turn around and hire people. It's just like the market where they mm -hmm. say a um, a bear market, a bull market always follows a bear market. So I'm trying, to, <laughs> I'm trying to learn the investments yeah. in the lingo. So yeah, so right. this yeah. won't last forever. And when we come back, it's going to be a surge. Um, and that means you're going to have to turn around and hire people. So I just wanted yeah. folks to um, hit the pause button and recognize there are some stats out there, Mark. And I've seen it in different uh, places where... When it comes to administrative work, it is estimated that about 80% or higher of administrative work is kind of wasteful, meaning that it's not contributing the value and value as defined by the customer, right? Not value. Right. And so we in this field, we understand that value is defined by the customer. I've had several um, projects with teams, and this always turns out to be the case when they're not familiar with lean or how you define value, where it is the business that is trying to define the value. And when we right. do that, that means we're holding on to a lot of stuff that if the client or the customer found out that we were doing these things, they would say, what in the heck are you doing? And I don't see how that's related to what you're supposed to be delivering to me. And so we get we have an emotional attachment because in a lot of times we have created all this stuff. And when you create it, you're kind of attached to it. This is your baby and it may not yeah. be adding value at all. So when it comes to lean before layoffs, I am just asking that we pause and challenge ourselves. And if the research is true, that a, around 80%, give or take, of administrative work is wasteful, let's take the time to examine what we do, how we do it, and get rid of that waste. And let's try to right. optimize what we're doing first and then eventually you need to let some people go. Um, the main goal is to make sure that we're not working on things that don't add value. In this current climate, as in a, a business, you can't afford to continue to work on things that are wasteful. It doesn't make sense for you yeah. as a company and it doesn't make sense from the, the client perspective. So that's what I, yep. my challenge was when I said lean before layoffs, you know, maybe now is the time to really start examining mm -hmm. what you do, how you do it. And maybe a business does not have to do a full value stream map. <laughs> you know, maybe they don't have to mm -hmm. go that far, even though I would recommend it's a good exercise but somehow have a strategy or approach to examining the work, identifying 
the um, value added activities and the wasteful activities in, in my um, certification, the acronym TIMWOOD that stuck with mm -hmm. me. <laughs> it was easy to remember. Yeah. So looking at uh, transportation of materials, inventory, you know, if we're keeping too much inventory, uh, all this motion that we've got in between departments mm -hmm. or, or it could be just moving files. I know one individual I talked to a month ago, she worked for a fast food restaurant and she said every quarter they looked at customer service uh, data and they were still in the um, um, hard copies, paper copies of the data, not electronic. And so they created this big binders of all this customer service related data created big binders for all these managers in the region. They put all these binders together, got in a car, went to a central location for these regional meetings, and you had all these binders. I don't remember, remember if she said the number, but it sounds like a lot. And they had these meetings reviewing um, the data. And so look there with uh, transportation, we're getting in the car, we're driving to a location, materials, we've got all these binders, we've got paper, um, and that is all wasteful. So she was involved in a project where they identified we can have a virtual meeting so we're not transporting from you know point A to point B. We can um, have electronic dashboards. We don't need to generate papers and papers and put them in a binder. And with this project, that hits several elements of the Tim Wood in terms of transportation, motion, mm -hmm. and um, probably over processing where you got just too many steps mm -hmm. and you don't need it. So that's a good example of before you co go cutting an, an employee um, who needs that job, that's a great example of looking at a process and you can save so much by doing mm -hmm. it differently. And again, I'm sh when I was talking to this in individual, she never said the word lean, but that is lean. Sure. That's a great example of lean. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you talk about lean before layoffs. There are some cases, even last year, it could be framed as lean instead of layoffs and rehiring, mm -hmm. as you were as you were saying. Um, UMass Memorial Healthcare is a great example where I think in a lot of cases, the default in the healthcare is to say, well, we don't have as much patient care to provide right now outside of COVID. And you'll see releases where spokesperson says, we had no choice but to lay people off. I'm like, but it is a choice. That's the rub, right? So UMass Memorial and their CEO, Dr. Eric Dixon, who is a great student of lean and a lean leader, said, no, nah, you know, we have a choice now. He had to go make the case to his board. He said it wasn't an easy case to make, but it came down now to mindsets where, you know, if you look at Jeff Liker's book, you know, we, we talked back in episode 400 most mm -hmm. recently, his book, The Toy It Away. Of the 14 principles, number one, and I'm sure it's number one for a reason, is long-term perspective. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so this, is, and, and UMass Memorial was making that case of like, we could let people go, furlough them, rehire them. There is a cost to doing that, both financially and from the sake of the organization. They paid people to work on improvement projects. Yeah and to cross train and to do things like Toyota would do to invest in their people. And, you know, it was really powerful when I interviewed Dr. Dixon, this was in the Habitual Excellence podcast series that I host. He says, the organization is better off once they got back mm -hmm. to higher levels of care. So it wasn't just go back to normal, they were creating a new normal because they were investing in people. And, and to me, that's some of the real potential mm -hmm. here if we can really change the way we do our work. Now, you, you prompted all kinds of thoughts from what you said, so I'll just maybe kind of limit to one more before getting more of your reactions. You know, this visceral, visceral reaction that people have to the word lean, and, the, and the, we could say, oh, we could, 
wish that it was a different word. But I think a lot of this comes back to habit. So earlier we talked about the habit of flavor of the month. Another well-ingrained, well-demonstrated habit to the employees is that when times get tough, we will lay some of you mm -hmm. off. And so when people hear about lean, they can't help but associate it to the habits that have already been mm -hmm. there when lean, in fact, might be um, a different mm -hmm. way. But what I wanted to throw back at you is, as a question or you know, for, for more of your thoughts, when you talk about 80% of work being waste, does that lead to fear? People might say, well, does that mean you're going to get rid of 80% of us? Mm. There's a different path. Though. Right. And I have not seen that. I, I have not seen that reaction. Yeah. But let me explain why maybe I have not seen that reaction in that um, Normally with my clients, I, before we start working with the um, team or the staff, I have taken time with the leader to um, make sure that we are aligned on what the goals are. I want to understand the staff. In fact, I had a meeting this morning with uh, a lead, a potential prospect, and we had a conversation mm -hmm. about tell me about your people, tell me about your team, and what are some of the attitudes about what you're trying to do? I need to understand that as I'm coming in and trying to support you. Uh, and so mm -hmm. that is a very important piece. So that when we, when we organize the kickoff meeting where I am introduced as the consultant, but I always have the sponsor talk first so the sponsor can share what the goals are, their commitment, and you know the process for this work. We are very mindful in the design of the kickoff to kind of set the stage for what we're doing, why we're doing it, the benefits, the risk, and making sure that they understand that their roles are important. They're part, part of the process. Again, it goes back to respect for people. And when you look mm -hmm. at Lean Six Sigma, it is very much about engaging them in the process. Uh, and in fact, with the lead that I talked to this morning, I said, I have never come into an organization only working with the leader. I, I can't imagine what that looks mm -hmm. like. I'm coming in working with the leader initially to help me get some understanding regarding what the goals are in the organization, the culture, et cetera. So we can be very thoughtful about setting up the kick kickoff in the project. But um, if you go in again, believing down into your bones, the principle of respect for people and that undergirds everything and something that's a very, um, intertwined in my brand and approach, Mark, is transparency, sincerity, um, being very authentic and people oriented. So when I speak to my clients and their teams, I want that, I want them to hear that from me, feel that from me in my body language, because again, in communication, it's not mostly words, it's tone, it's body language. So in all ways that I communicate, I want them to feel my sincerity. So I don't get that reaction uh, from teams. Now they may be thinking it, but it's not said. I don't feel that from them because hopefully they are feeling from the start of the project that we are very people focused and what we're trying to do. And they are very much part of the goal that we're trying to accomplish. Yeah, and, and I think you touched earlier on the idea of, you know, certain roles might change. Um, people might be assigned or retrained or given different or new opportunities. Uh, I, there was a hospital CEO I really admire, this is going back over a decade ago, he would tell his employees with Lean that they would commit to no layoffs. He would say, now your job might mm -hmm. change, but mm -hmm. your paycheck is going to be protected. Mm -hmm. And eliminating this waste and 
Um, sometimes moving people around is necessary so that we can protect the right. paycheck to provide value to the customer, to make sure that the organization, even as a nonprofit health system in that case, it needed to have a positive bottom right. line. Mm -hmm. You know, they still have those same financial pressures. But I, I would think, you know, maybe turning to the work you do in, in nonprofits, um, I, you know, I, there's been long advice, you know, even going back to manufacturing, that lean should be a growth strategy. So now you can redeploy people, um, so maybe serve more customers now that you're, uh, you've reduced waste. It would seem like in the nonprofit space, this could be really motivating, is that that growth means serving more people. Yes. With the same funds and contributions coming in the door. Like, it seems like that could be a real rallying. Cry. Yes. Um, it, yes. So growth, uh, expanding the reach. A lot of times, though, the majority of our focus is on maximizing the impact. So while growth mm -hmm. is a um, motivator, what I have found when I am brought into the picture, Mark, there are issues with effectiveness. There are issues with the sure. impact because that's what they're there for is to have the impact with the people that they're serving. So with the 20 that they're serving, they want to reach optimal impact first, then talk about um, mm -hmm. growth and scaling because mm -hmm. they don't have the um, fundamentals, the philosophy, mindset, culture, strategies, and frameworks that help them be effective with the 20 that they have. If they try to grow, yeah. and you know where I'm going, try to grow to reach, now it's not 20, it's 30, they're still not going to yeah. have the impact that they're trying to have in the community. Well, that's a, that's, a, that's a really good point. It's not just, maybe a different way of saying it, if I hear you, it's, it's not just touching more people, it's having a greater impact with those people. So I guess it comes back to, you, you, that's a really good point that you make. It's not just activity, it's outcomes. Absolutely. And in fact, there is um, some work that I'm, I was working on the uh, report this morning. It's actually a um, landscape analysis, also known kind of as an environmental scan for financial literacy uh, programming that occurs within the county. So within my county, of um, Marion County. And what I, I've discovered some interesting things that are related to what we're talking about now. Um, 50 entities, I surveyed 50 organizations, 37 replied, so that's 74%, which I was very excited about that. And I asked each of the entities uh, list the zip codes of the clients that you're serving and also the number of clients that you're serving. And I was uh, looking at the results this morning and actually all of the zip codes across Marion County within our 465 um, highway belt are covered. They're mm -hmm. all covered. And actually between all of them, a total of I think it was 59, a little over 59,000 um, citizens are being touched with these programs. So when you look mm -hmm. at, uh, and I saw that in the survey results, several of them talked about, well, they don't have enough reach. They want a greater reach. But when I look at everything collectively, all <laughs> zip codes right. are covered. And in fact, within each zip code, there are multiple resources that provide this type of programming. So do we really need everybody to try to continue to grow? I don't think so. So that means yeah. that I think there's opportunity to look at um, other things like for example, with all the entities that provide this programming, maybe not everyone is providing the same programming. So how can we collaborate um, create mm -hmm. coalitions or do have more of a referral system, you know, so that came to mind. And then how can we be more effective? Because we have more and more families 
who are, we call them um, Alice families. So they're asset limited, income constrained, but employed. So we have more and more families that are falling in this category because, you know, some people may assume, well, folks are just poor because they're too lazy to work. No, you'd be surprised how many people are actually working, but they're struggling. And so there's opportunity to figure out how do we be more effective for these families? So my my point is um, this survey has been uh, it'll be really good because I'm working. Well, I'm saying it'll be really good because I'm writing it. But no, I mean, it's will be very informative because I think agencies will see at least I think it's not about growth. We have plant. We yeah. are resource rich. We are resource rich mm-hmm. in every zip code. But then the question is, are we being very strategic and thoughtful about how we are delivering services, how we are collaborating across, and I surveyed banks and nonprofit agencies. So those are silos. So how are we working across the different types of organizations to be more effective and what we're delivering? I think there's a lot of opportunity there. And I will not be emphasizing growth (laughs) <laughs> or when I dig into the data a little bit more, we could find out of all those entities, the different types of services that are being provided. And maybe we have duplication in one type of service, but and, and we might be heavily tilted in these types of services, but then we have a gap over here. That's where the opportunities Mm -hmm. are in the analysis. But I think oftentimes, uh, again, these knee-jerk reactions, we think, well, we got to grow and and, uh, reach more people. Mm -hmm. No, I I don't think so in this case, but it took the analysis to come to that conclusion. Well, and it seems like we need to grow is um, a countermeasure. So you raise a really good point thinking back to what we call it scientific problem solving or A3 problem solving, like what really is the problem? What are the measures? What are the gaps? You make a great point. The gap is not reach. The gap is impact. So that's, that's, that's a really, really good point. Yes. And Mark, if I can add one more thing, uh, now being mm-hmm. out here as a solar, uh, solopreneur and working with different clients who are across uh, different sectors, a common denominator with every single client is not being clear on the problem. And that's, you know, Mm -hmm. the first step, the Demaic in Six Sigma. And uh, I love Albert Einstein's quote where he said, what, if I had an hour to work on a problem, I'd spend, what, 55 minutes thinking about the problem and five minutes on the solution. I love that because it turns out to be true with all the projects that I've worked on where if we spend more time in understanding and defining the problem, it always leads to better solutions, always. Yeah, yeah, and there are different variations of of the quote, like there's a version of that quote attributed to Abraham Lincoln Uh, about if I had an hour to chop down a tree, I'd spend 55 minutes sharpening the ax, or there are different versions of, they say, I mean, they make a point. Yeah, I don't know how, histor- how historically Yeah, Yeah, yeah accurate, we don't know but... who we can actually tie it to, but we get the gist. Get the gist. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so maybe a final question here, Joy. Um, coming back to the word optimist is, is clearly an important word to you between um, the name of your uh, company, Optimist Business Solutions, and your book, The Optimist. What, what does being an optimist mean to you and why, why is that so important? Thank you for the question. It is the word optimist is central to who I am, first of all. Um, Mark, when I also coach uh, female leaders of organizations and one thing that I have them do is identify the four or five words that define them and they can look upon those words to help empower them and encourage them. Um, Basically, affirmations. One of my words is uh, optimism, because I sincerely believe with all my heart 
there's no problem out there that we can't solve. I really believe that. And if, uh, in a lot of cases, you could say, well, poverty, we can't solve poverty. You'd be surprised how many entities are actually vested in maintaining poverty. Um, so that's another thing I have discovered that a lot of times with problems, you actually have a good number of people that are vested in the problem and that contributes to the problem remaining because there's actually a benefit mm -hmm. for them. I have found that out in the social sector as well as in mm -hmm. the private sector. And so that, so that raises mm -hmm. a difficult question, no. sorry, of, of, of cannot or will not. Yes. Oh my goodness. So in the um, Optimist book mm -hmm. where I talk about um, sustainable solutions for uh, women in business, I talk about the willingness because again, I've had uh, I've had the experience of being with a client, and the willingness was not was not there. Uh, and so we're not going to get anywhere if you're not willing and curious and optimistic about the possibilities. So my overall philosophy is, I start out with, we can solve this problem, and I can tell pretty quickly when I'm dealing with a leader who does not believe the problem can be solved, because if you don't believe, well, then it can't be solved. You've got to start with the belief. Right, that's self-fulfilling. Yes, it is. So yeah. you've got to start with the belief that it can be solved. And so I bring that to, I bring that mindset to my clients. We can do this. Also with my coaching, yeah. we can yeah. do this. I know there's a way. Um, also, what often I find myself telling folks is that somewhere out on the planet, somebody has figured this problem out. I know it. <laughs> so now since we're less than six degrees, remember that phrase, six degrees of separation? We are not six mm -hmm. degrees anymore. <laughs> we are not yeah. six degrees. So I'm sure between the research and one's network, we can find a best practice on who is doing it and doing it well. And not to say that you would duplicate exactly what they're doing, but you will learn some right. some um, different ways that you can do it better. So it's just ingrained in who I am. And then plus, I'm a, a spiritual person. I am a Christian. You don't have to be a Christian to be an optimist. I am just saying that there's um, a foundation there for me where I do believe mm -hmm. in something that's bigger than me, bigger than um, humans, just what we can control. And I do believe mm -hmm. that the universe is working for our good. If you believe it, if you believe mm -hmm. it, and we have some patience, um, and then if we believe it, then that's the lens through which you will see the world. And so that's what I have have chosen for my life because it's a choice. And again, I bring that, I want to bring that into the spaces where I'm in because it's a, um, it's a higher vibration. So if you kind of, you know, read up on energies and vibrations, everything has an energy and, and vibration. We're made up of, you know, energy and atoms have energy and there are lower energy emotions and attitudes and higher uh, vibrating energy emotions and attitudes. I want to be at a higher vibration and bring that into the space. So it's, it's who I am. And I wanted to make sure that the name of my company, yes, I'm about business and yes, I'm about solutions. Sure but I'm bringing my values into what I do and what I bring to a client. So that's why it's Optimist Business Solutions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's great. That's great. Uh, and um, yeah, it makes me think around, like, you know, pointing out, a lot of this comes down to organizational culture, pointing out problems, pointing out waste, opportunities for improvement. That sometimes gets people labeled as being negative. Why are you being so negative? Where I think I, I agree with you, it, it, it's inherently optimistic because I wouldn't point it out if I didn't think we could fix it. It's the person who says, we've tried solving that for 20 years and that's not solvable. That's, to me, that's <laughs> negative. Yes. <laughs> yes, it's funny. I think with all of us who are in this space and field, we've heard some very similar 
uh, feedback and, and complaints. But again, we stay in the field because we're optimistic. We know we're going to hear the cynics and the critics and those who don't believe. But I, I think we all have enough uh, data points where we were able to um, bring an organization or a team bring them along where they could see the light and where they start to have the ahas and see the benefit yeah. of continuous improvement and lean and six sigma and again it may not stick totally the way we would like it and so that's something that i've had to let go of as well that um you know, we would like to see when we leave as a consultant, a lot of things really stick. And a lot of times there's uh -huh. aspects that don't. But if we can see that we've changed the mindset a little bit and moved the needle a little bit and made some progress, then that's a good thing. That's something that I've kind of learned early on yeah. in this uh, entrepreneurial venture. Yeah. yeah. And so if people want to learn more about said venture and contact you, again, Joy Mason from Optimus Business Solutions. Website is? My website is Optimus Indy. So that's Optimus with the T there, I-N-D-Y dot com, Optimus dot com. And you'll see all my information there as well as my contact information. But I'll give my email. It's the letter J, Mason, M-A-S-O-N, at optimistindy.com and I'd be more than happy to to uh, have a short chat with anyone who wants to hear more or explore a little more so well great and that's optimistindy.com indy as in Indianapolis not as in <laughs> Indianapolis I-N-D-Y yes yeah People talk about, you know, uh, indie record label or mm -hmm. you know, whatever. So, yeah, indie, Indianapolis. So thank you for the work that you're continuing to do, Joy, um, you know, in your, uh, you know, your community with nonprofit organizations. Um, it's, it's great to hear that there are applications of these approaches there that, um, yeah, I, I'm glad you're working toward greater impact. So thank you, Joy, for, for being a great guest and for sharing um, a lot of your experiences and a lot of thought-provoking moments and, you know, and that, that light bulb over my head. Um, yeah, uh, the, thank you for all of that. Well, thank you, Mark. It's <laughs> been a pleasure and I've been looking forward to uh, being with you. I know we talked about it for a while, so it's good that we finally made it work and I continue to follow you. Yeah. So thank you for everything that you're doing in this space and, and trying to uh, share what's going on in the lean world and continuing also to inspire the rest of us who are maybe, um, you know, at different points in our journey. So I appreciate your contribution as well. Okay. Well, thank you. That's, that's too kind, but I appreciate that. So Joy, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, I'm going to sign you up to do this again someday. Okay. That? That'll work. Thank you. We'll, we'll take a deeper dive maybe into the types of work that you're doing in the nonprofit space. I feel like we only scratched the surface. Okay. I would like that. Thanks. Yeah. Great.